Father, I am thankful for you opening up the doors here at Wayside Chapel for your word to be taught, not just in this class, Father, but in all the men and women who are devoted to your word here at Wayside, for Roger and his work in preaching the word, Father, for all the Bible study teachers and the uh, staff who put your word above all else. I, I praise you, Father, that you have given Wayside that, that charge in this city to be the carrier of your torch, the word, and to illuminate the city by by your word. And I thank you, Father, that you've also called me to that opportunity here. And I humbly ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit would be the teacher through me and that what we would say and speak in this room would be honoring to you and give glory to you and to your word. And, uh, Father, when it may happen that I may speak in error and that teaching may be incorrect, that you in, in your infinite wisdom would correct that in the hearts of those who hear this word and would know the truth despite me. And, Father, we thank you for the provision of this room and for the refreshments we have waiting for us. And, Father, for safe travel to and from this building tonight, we pray for all of those things, even for those who have yet to join us and are still on their way. Father, we pray for them as well. And in all that we do, Father, I praise you that you brought us together as you promised to do so that we might be built up in the faith by your word and equipped for the the work of ministry that you call us each to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, for those who were here for some of the earlier chapters of Luke, uh, some of you, particularly if you were here at the very end of the last series, uh, you may remember we ended in chapter 12, literally halfway through the book. Since we have had such an extended pause in the study, and and especially for the case of those who have just joined us, I want to take a few minutes to review uh, basically a transition that Luke himself is making. As we leave chapter 12, And going to chapter 13, there's a very distinct transition taking place. In fact, when I last taught 12, I mentioned that 12 was one of the best chapters in the Bible on Christian discipleship, though that may not be how it's typically uh, characterized. Many may not look to chapter 12 of Luke for a lesson on discipleship. In fact, that's what that chapter gives us, a very detailed, blow-by-blow teaching from Jesus himself on discipleship. Jesus taught, for example, that there, the disciples should uh, remember the importance of maintaining the right priorities in life and in their ministry. If you go back and look in chapter 12, you'll notice he brings that point up. He p- brings up a point on maintaining a steady reliance on God rather than on themselves. So he speaks on the need to be reliant on God in chapter 12. In chapter 12, he also taught on not allowing our fears and our worries to drive our decisions because in fear and in worry, we will make the wrong decision rather than relying on Him and trusting in Him. And he goes into all of those topics in great detail with examples and with parables. And again, if you haven't had a chance to study chapter 12 with me or at any time, I really encourage you to go back through and read through chapter 12 and remind yourself of some of that detail. And as I said, if you weren't here when we taught that, you can get that teaching on CD. Just let me know and I'll be happy to provide that. But at the end of that chapter, and as we make a transition into tonight's teaching, at the end of that chapter, Jesus' focus changes somewhat. He begins to speak on the need to recognize signs and on settling our debts and on making decisions, on making a decision. Right at the end of chapter 12, he brings up examples of a man being dragged before a magistrate. And in the course of being dragged before a magistrate, he decides to make good with his accuser before reaching the judge. Jesus says you do that smartly because if you made it all the way to the judge, you'd surely face the judgment of that judge. So he talks about the need to settle debts before judgment. And if you look with me just briefly in chapter 12, and for example, very end, 54 through 56 of chapter 12 in Luke, scan those verses with me and you'll notice he, he reminds the crowd, for example, if they're capable of paying close enough attention to signs in the sky that could predict coming weather, he says, why can't you pay enough attention, in other words, to the signs of Jesus as he was performing miracle after miracle in their presence, why are they so adept at recognizing signs in the sky and yet they can't tell the signs that he's performing means he's the Messiah? They can't claim ignorance, however, because as we taught earlier in the, in the chapters that preceded chapter 12, they did in fact recognize who he was. And Jesus here at the end of chapter 12 actually says, you're capable of recognizing who I am. In fact, look at verse 56. If you have any doubt about how I'm characterizing the end of chapter 12, I want you to look carefully with me at chapter 12, verse 56. He uses a term as he accuses the crowd that is very insightful. How does he describe the crowd? He calls them hypocrites. Now, listen to what that word means. What is a hypocrite? 
Is a hypocrite someone who's ignorant? No, you generally don't go to someone who's simply ignorant of facts and call them a hypocrite. Hypocrite is a very specific term, and it means someone who is claiming to be ignorant in this case, but who is not. You don't use the word ignorant against, or uh, hypocrite against the crowd if their problem is they're blind to the truth. You use it, on the other hand, if they have recognized the truth, but they refuse to accept it. And more importantly, they refuse to admit that they've recognized it. They are trying to claim ignorance as a defense. In verse 58, Jesus teaches them about that guilty man I mentioned who's taken before the judge or is on his way to the judge to have his day in court. And he makes the obvious conclusion. You know, if that guilty man knows enough to make amends with the accuser before he reaches the judge, then you should know the same. Because if those in this crowd remain unrepentant, in the same sense as a man unwilling to admit his fault before reaching the judge, if they are to remain unrepentant of their hypocrisy in the face of clear signs that the Messiah stands before them, then they're in the same danger of reaching the judge on a given day and having lost their opportunity to repent beforehand. And as a result, they will face certain judgment. They will be guilty. So what's Jesus up to here? Why is he building this way? You can tell he's ratcheting it up. Now, we've jumped into the middle of the, of the gospel, I recognize, and we've come in at the end of chapter 12. So I'm giving you this brief perspective, this brief context on which to travel with me into chapter 13. But I think even with what we've just said, you've had enough already to recognize that there's a building pressure on this crowd. They've been following with Jesus now, many of them probably for days and weeks even. His reputation preceded him. Earlier in chapter 9, he's said to have now departed and set his eyes on Jerusalem and on the ascension that will take place there. He's done with his days of wandering uh, in the land of the Galilee, and he's moving on. And he's now begun to ratchet up the pressure on the crowd. This is an interesting discourse we're about to go into here in chapter 13. And Luke, as we leave thir uh, chapter 12, he leaves us hanging a little bit with his tension. And I love this transition. You know, the first half of chapter 13 is really unique in the Gospels in that most of the first half of chapter 13 is completely unique to Luke. None of the other Gospels, not the Synoptic Gospels, not John, covers the material we're going to see over the next couple of weeks here at the first half of chapter 13. And I find it interesting for one reason more than any other. Why did Luke choose to capture these details in his Gospel when the other writers didn't? And we all know that the Gospel record is not a complete diary of Jesus' life. It picks each of the Gospels, pick and choose events and display them according to the purpose of the writer. So that begs the question, why did Luke choose to incorporate these details at the beginning of chapter 13 when the other writers did not? It gives us insight not only into the message he's trying to communicate, but into his purpose for writing. Let's go now with that introduction into chapter 13. We'll read the first five verses. Luke 13, verse 1. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In looking at these verses, Luke begins chapter 13 with the words, on the same occasion. As Luke moves then out of chapter 12 and into chapter 13, he's saying that this report, the one we're about to discuss and study, occurred in the midst of the conversations that we just came out of in chapter 12. So here again, Luke chooses to record an event that the other gospel writers, for whatever reason, overlooked. And he puts it in this moment which then adds a context for why he gave it. From the text, it's probably clear to you as it was to me that we're left with the impression that Jesus is teaching, he's speaking to the crowd, probably on the very points we see at the end of chapter 12. And then some in this crowd, some group within the crowd, had traveled down from Jerusalem to this place, wherever they were at the time, probably somewhere still in, in the region of Samaria, and as they arrive, they're probably sharing their experiences in Jerusalem with those in the crowd. Not necessarily with Jesus specifically, though it says the report came to him, and I'm not saying he didn't get it directly from them himself, but I don't think that their purpose and arrival was like uh, you know, the days of the Pony Express. They've ridden into town, they jump off, and they run up to Jesus, and they give him the report. I, I don't get the impression that they would have thought this was quite that noteworthy, nor would it have been their responsibility to do it. 
More likely the case, they were speaking in the crowd, sharing some juicy bit of gossip or of news that they had heard. Remember, in the days before the Internet, in the days before even newspapers, this is the way news gets around. As they report to the crowd what they've heard and seen, perhaps, in Jerusalem, it catches, obviously, Jesus' attention. And he chooses to respond as he overhears this report. And look at his response. He has a tremendously intriguing response considering what he's just heard. He disputes the conclusion that this crowd had evidently made about what they had heard. But we don't necessarily know that the crowd had spoken this conclusion whatsoever. It's almost as though he jumps over the discussion of the topic and begins to bring up a new issue that's obviously derived from the topic. They're talking about the event he jumps to the conclusion they are making in their minds about the news, showing his divinity even in that small moment, his ability to discern their thoughts. But to fully appreciate why Jesus said what he did, we're going to first going to have to go back and understand why the crowds in their own minds had come to the conclusion that he's implying they did come to. We have to go to that first. Why is it that they brought that thought into their mind as a result of hearing this news? So we've got to review a few things. Let's begin by reviewing who the Galileans are. Uh, To put it simply, Galileans are residents of the Galilee. That's not a big stretch, I'm sure. Galilee is that land in northern Israel surrounding the Sea of Galilee. That's where it gets its name, obviously. It was the northernmost district of Israel as uh, constituted under Roman authority. It included territories of Zebulun and Naphtali uh, out of the tribes of Israel. So if you have a map that shows you where the tribes settled, Galilee roughly corresponds to those two tribes. We all know if you've studied the Gospels already that Jesus uh, grew up in the Galilee, as did most of the disciples, by the way. That's also where he chose to appear to them after his resurrection was in the Galilee. As the story goes, as far as we can tell from Scripture here, Pilate mixes the blood of these people, of these Galileans, with the blood of their sacrifices. Now, this is a curious event for several reasons. First, uh, we don't have any other mention of this event in Scripture or in extra-biblical texts, even in non-biblical historical texts, there's no mention of an event like this of any kind, whether Galileans or otherwise. So it's it's an oddity because we don't have any cross-reference that we know of that would help us understand this moment. We really only have the text as Luke presents it here. So from the text, we have to surmise a few things. Uh, We can probably surmise that these Galileans had traveled to Jerusalem for the purpose of offering sacrifices. I think that's a fair expectation. But that alone is interesting because the only time a non-priest could offer a sacrifice in the temple on their own behalf is at Passover. So it suggests that the event at which they would have been participating is the Passover event of a family bringing a spotless lamb before the altar and sacrificing it in the temple. Now apparently, if we understand what Luke is teaching here, they were at the point of performing that sacrifice to the point of bloodletting so that the animal's blood had been spilled where it was appropriate. But in the midst of that event, somehow they were slain themselves and their blood was mixed with the blood of those sacrifices. That's probably the fairest interpretation. Now, to to, to be accurate or to be fair, there are others who have taken this language and gone elsewhere in trying to make sense of what Luke is saying. But but the the more accepted, more commonly accepted view is the one I'm teaching here of, of simply an event that occurred coincident with their own sacrificing in the temple. But of course... Why are we thinking, what does it mean that they were killed? What is the significance of Galileans being killed in the temple while sacrificing? Um, Why, another way to put it is, why is the crowd so interested in this event? And before you say, well, of course, any death, any murder, something of that nature would catch someone's attention. Well, you have to take yourself back a little bit in time and in history and understand the circumstances of the day in a Roman-controlled area, a Roman-controlled colony, if you will, like Israel. Pilate and the other Roman authorities, for that matter, were well known as men who persecuted the Jews, who held life with low regard, particularly Jewish life. They often solidified their control and their authority by their willingness to take uh, this, this kind of action against anyone who crossed them. It was the way they maintained control. And a death at the hand of Pilate, in and of itself, was not newsworthy. And keeping in mind that the fact that we find it in the record of the Gospel suggests it had newsworthiness to the crowd and to Jesus himself, and of course it became a teaching moment. In this case, the news might have been more interesting simply because of where they were killed. Because of the fact that sacrificing at the temple during Passover was the single most important religious event in the life of an individual Jew, 
in their annual year of festivals and in their annual year of obligations under the law, the thing that mattered most to any given individual Jew was the Passover celebration, being in Jerusalem and celebrating the Passover. So it, it was a time when a Jew could personally go and make amends before God for sin. There were times when you saw you know, national atonement for sin. And there are times when you saw individual atonement on a lesser degree level on lesser degrees uh, in, in other ways but to have this one event a year where you were going in and you were atoning and you were recognizing God's deliverance of the nation of Israel was a singular event in the life of a Jew so failing to observe the Passover in fact carried a strict penalty under the law in Numbers 9.13 just to give you some context Numbers 9.13 says a man who is clean and is not on a journey and yet neglects to observe the Passover that person shall be cut off from his people for he did not present the offering of the Lord at its appointed time, that man will bear his sin. Which is to say that man will not be atoned for his sin. It's a very strict punishment applied under the law for those who would voluntarily not observe the Passover. So perhaps we can surmise that the Galileans were struck down in the midst of a Passover sacrifice. And to the average Jew, that fact alone, the fact that they were struck down in that critical moment, a moment when they were trying to atone for sin, it, it's almost as if God rejected their atonement. It's almost as if God was judging them in that way by the nature of their penalty and the way that he struck them down. The Jew could interpret that to be a sign of God's displeasure with those people, that he would choose to take them out, if you will, in that way and in that moment. Because to a Jew, God is clearly sovereign. He can do it any day he wants, to anyone he wants, any way he wants. So by virtue of the way he did it, and the timing, it seems to be communicating God's displeasure with those people. And so, to the crowd, this event implied those men, whoever they were, were particularly sinful men. So sinful, in fact, that God would not even permit them to follow through with the sacrifice to him at his throne. That was the interpretation. And to see that that interpretation is likely what's on in the minds of the crowd, now look again at Jesus' response. In verse 2, he asked the crowd, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? And implied in that is because of the way they died, because of this news about them, do you think that means they were worse sinners than all others? Just by the way he asked the question, we learn that the crowd had come to that conclusion. The crowd had assumed the Galileans got what they deserved. Why? Simply because of the circumstances of their death. That's all they know at this point. But we have that same impression, don't we? Tell me if I'm wrong here, but don't we encourage that same thinking at times, maybe not intentionally so, but you know, bad things happen to bad people. People get their comeuppance. You know, there's, there's, that, that somehow their living and their lifestyle and their behavior and their attitude toward God or their, their sinful behavior has brought the kind of tragic end that defined their lives. I mean, we may not consciously make that a principle in our teaching. We certainly may not claim that as doctrine in some sense, but I think we all have a tendency to do maybe what this crowd was doing, and that is fall into that thinking if we're not watching ourselves, if we're not checking that thinking against Scripture. We're prone to say, you know, could have told them that would have happened. You know, they got what they deserve. But to the Jew, and kind of going back into the text, to the Jew, this relationship between righteousness and life circumstances was an absolute rule. It was far more ingrained in their culture than even in ours today. The Jewish culture in Jesus' day often saw bad things happening to people as divine judgment, pure and simple. Divine judgment, in fact, for past sin. This kind of thinking, I'll tell you, though, is wrong for two fundamental reasons. And I want to go through this because I want you to see what Jesus is trying to do with this crowd. And it's really something that we can see in our own lives, perhaps, as well. First, when you assume a cause and effect relationship, between the circumstances in someone's life and God's pleasure or lack thereof of that person, then we're diminishing God's sovereignty. Now, hear me correctly here. I'm not suggesting sin does not have consequences. Clearly, it does. To live a life uh, in abject sin is going to bring all number of misery and by design because God is not going to be mocked in that. But that doesn't imply that every bad thing that happens to everybody is directly related to a sin in their life. That's the mistake of thinking that we're trying to con consider here. Is it proof, when something bad happens to someone, that God was unhappy with them? To suggest that is to actually diminish his sovereignty because we're suggesting a cause and effect relationship between a person's life and God's plan for that person that is absolute. This is a relationship that 
self-evidently does not necessarily exist, or at least it's a premature judgment on our part that that was God's plan for the person. And let me give you some examples. Remember in John chapter 9, perhaps you've read the uh, Gospel of John, you might remember in John 9, verse 2, when the disciples questioned Jesus about a man who had been born blind. It's a very famous exchange, and I'll give you just two verses as it's captured in in John chapter 9. As his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, if you've read that before, let me ask you to think about it one more time, but now in the context of what we're teaching today. Look at what the disciples assumed. This shows you, by the way, how ingrained this thinking was in the nation of Israel and in the Jewish culture. They had a guy born blind, born that way. So they couldn't go immediately to the assumption that it was his own behavior that created this circumstance. But they're so unwilling to break that assumption. They're so unwilling to give up that, that thinking that they're going back in history to his parents in order to find the connection. That's how strong the relationship existed in the Jewish mind. And what does Jesus say in response to that assumption? He says, number one, it had nothing to do with his sin, and it had nothing to do with the sin of his parents. Rather, he says, and this is a paraphrase, but I believe it's an accurate paraphrase, Jesus says, God made this man blind so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. And those mighty works, of course, refer to the fact that in the next series of verses, Jesus heals the man of his blindness. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. Think about that for a minute. For God to reveal himself through his son, and more specifically through his son's miracles, it required that he first have a subject on which to perform the miracle. Which means that in order for God to do that, he had to have an opportunity to heal. He had to have somebody with an infirmity and position that person so that when the timing was right, God could show his mighty works through that person. So we're saying here that God created blindness for the sake of his might being shown, his glory being made known, his son being revealed. That man's life was changed in the way that it was changed for God's glory. Now, at this point, if you're feeling a tendency to judge God over that decision, I want you to check that very quickly because remember, he's the potter. That man was clay. God can form him any way he wants. And that is why I say when you assume that it had to be some action that predetermined his outcome, his sin, or his parents' sin. When you make that assumption, you've diminished God's sovereignty. You've said, God couldn't have purposed it that way. God couldn't have designed it that way. It had to have been cause and effect, the man's own fault, the parent's own fault. That removes a sovereign aspect of God's nature and character as revealed in Scripture from being, in fact, the reason for what happened. Does our view of God leave room for this truth of the Bible? Are we prepared to accept that bad things happen to good people for God's glory? Bad being a relative term, obviously. Bad being, from maybe our perspective, being uninformed of Scripture. And what about Job? Maybe the classic example, and I won't go this much farther, but I want you to consider something about Job that I saw as I studied for this that really knocked me down, really. It was dramatic in my mind, perhaps in yours as well. I'll recap Job for you in a nutshell. In one moment... Job hears that all his children are died. Now, I want you to try to personalize this if you can. Imagine yourself in Job's position for just a moment. All his children died in a single moment. All the herds, which represented his wealth for the most part, all his herds had been taken away by thieves, and all but three of his servants had been killed in the process. So he's left with literally nothing. Later in the story, he suffers horrible physical ailments as a continuation of his um, misfortune, if you will. All, again, by God's providence, if you know the story. But here's the point that knocked me down. I want you to consider this in light of today's teaching. Did those things happen to Job because he had some serious sin in his life? Now, we know, for the most part, that answer, right? If you've studied Job, you know that Job is not credited with that sin as being the cause, not none whatsoever, in fact. It's funny that even his friends later try to convince him that that may, in fact, be the cause of his calamity. See the thinking there again in the Jewish culture. His friends return to that cause and effect explanation to try to soothe him, if that's possible, of his circumstances. But what does Scripture tell us? Look with me, and you may not have time to turn and you don't need to, but in Job chapter 1, verse 8, write this down maybe, look at it later. Job 1, verse 8. Look at how Job enters into the conversation between God and Satan. Job 1, 8. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless man and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. 
Do you realize that when those bad things happened to Job, they came at the hands of the enemy? Yes, Satan was the instrument that actually brought those things to bear in his life. But do you realize that Job himself came into the conversation because God introduced him into the conversation? God suggested him to Satan. So what we're saying here is that God gave the devil the target. He, in fact, invited it, did he not? Have you considered my servant, Job? So when Job experienced all those calamities in his life, it's fair, I think, to say that God ultimately was the instigator of the moment. Satan being the the owner and the originator of sin. Satan being the one who created those negative things. Satan being the one through whom the evil occurred. But God himself being the master, the sovereign king who determined it would be Job who would suffer those things. And why did he introduce Job to Satan? What was the reason why he used Job and not someone else? Because he had sin? Because he made so many mistakes we need to get him back? Because He's making so many errors that I have to get his attention? No, because he was blameless and upright. In other words, his blamelessness was the reason for his calamity. Now, does our view of God out of Scripture give that kind of license? Are we prepared to agree and understand that out of Scripture, good people may have bad things happen to them because they're good? Where do we hear Christ telling us that those who would believe in his name and be a witness for his sake in this world will suffer persecution? Not may. But will. Are we prepared to understand that not in every case when something bad happens to us are we looking at something that is the product of our sin? No, it may very well be the case that God is using our misfortune, if you think of it in those terms, our calamity, if you want to call it that, to His glory, for His name's sake. And the way that glory is ultimately obtained, of course, is in our response to those circumstances. What do we do in the face of things that we can't explain and don't understand and frankly don't like? Maybe we can find a direct relationship to a sin in our life, and if so, then that's where we ought to be putting our attention. But if we can't immediately, perhaps we need to at least give time for God to work in our heart to explain it. And if no explanation comes, are we prepared to give him glory over the fact that he saw fit to bring something like that upon us, maybe for righteousness' sake? Proverbs 16.9 says, the, man, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And Proverbs 20.24 20, sort of follows that up. Man's steps are ordained by the Lord, then how can a man understand his way? Which is just further proof of God's control. So the first mistake we make when we begin to assume a cause and effect relationship on the basis of sin is that we reduce God's sovereignty. But the second one, and I won't take near as long on this, the second one is that that thinking makes us a judge of another person. And now we fall into the trap of judging. When we decide that someone's poor circumstances are due to their sin, we become... The person Jesus was talking about when he said, take the log out of your own eye before you take the splinter out of someone else's eye. Think about that for a minute. The flip side of that really is that we've assumed that our own relative lack of misfortune must be because God is pleased with us. That's really what's at stake here. When we're ready to tell someone else that their sin is is responsible for their problems in their life, what we've also done in that same moment is we've said, and because I don't have your problem, it's self-evident I don't have your sin. We may not say it. We may not even really think it. But it's built into that thinking. It's underlying that thinking. It's a comparison that we make all the time, even if we aren't aware of it. Judging others in the negative sense of the word, and there is a positive sense, but in the negative sense of judgment, as Christ forbids it, it always brings with it an attitude of superiority, of unjustified superiority. Like the parable suggests, I have to overlook my own mistakes, that giant log sticking out of my face. I have to be willing to overlook it so that I can get to that splinter in your own eye. It's a sense of misplaced superiority. The best way to avoid falling into this trap, by the way, is to remember we all have sin. And as Scripture teaches, no sin is any less worthy of punishment than any other. Sin is sin is sin. If you want some current day examples to just think about on your own later, ask yourself why missionaries die in Africa. Ask yourself why martyrs died in the early church. In other words, Begin to break down any assumption you may have made in your life about why bad things happen and why good things happen and recognize that there is not an automatic cause and effect relationship between what happens in a person's life and God's pleasure or lack thereof in that person's walk. So what about Jesus' comments to the crowd in chapter 13? He says in verse 3, no, I tell you no. In other words, he contradicts that thinking, meaning that those men who died were not worse 
than the general average run-of-the-mill Galilean. And more importantly, and look at how he ends it as he turns to the end of that statement, they're not worse than you. And that's where the issue really lies. They weren't worse than the average Galilean, and by the way, they aren't any worse than you also. Or said another way, you're just as sinful as those men who died in the temple. And unless you repent, he says, you will likewise perish. Now, did he mean they're going to likewise die at the hands of Pilate while sacrificing at the Passover in the temple? No. Clearly, his point is not to be so concrete and specific. What he did mean was that just like those men and women who met a tragic end at the end of their life and died in sin, this crowd is likewise going to expect a tragic outcome at the end of their lives if they don't first repent and receive their Messiah. It's a call to understand and believe in who he is. Now, in the next couple of verses, and we'll move on here, but in the next couple of verses, look at how he emphasizes the point further by bringing up his own example. I have to believe by the context, this is really just another modern day, modern meaning in his day, uh, modern day news event. Something that must have happened in about the time of Jesus' uh, ministry. Something that was noteworthy, that was infamous perhaps. He tells about a tower that fell on 18 people in Siloam. This, again, is a reference that has no cross-reference outside of Scripture. We do know, of course, that there is a famous pool of Siloam mentioned in John 9. It was a pool that was famous because it was a source of healing, many believed. And so what was a, a pool famous for healing going to attract? Cripples. Infirm, you know, people with infirmities. So whatever happened around this tower, maybe there was a, an accident that the, the, some piece of the infrastructure around the tower fell, and it fell on people that were sitting around the pool and couldn't move very fast, probably. And it killed 18. We don't know anything more about this, as I said. But Jesus draws a parallel that makes the obvious point for us, right? If you heard about the 18 dying at the pool and you thought they were worse than average sinners, you were wrong then as well. Again, he says, this crowd is no different. It doesn't matter how their lives ended. They could have been killed by Pilate. They could have had a tower falling on them. Or whatever they ended up dying of. In the end, all who go to the grave, unrepentant of sin, and having lived a life, apart from God, are going to receive a similar measure of judgment. I don't care if you die peacefully in your sleep in your bed. The effect of dying without repentance and belief in a Messiah is still the same. Have you ever heard the phrase, what keeps most people from reaching heaven is that they aren't bad enough? What keeps most people from reaching heaven is they aren't bad enough. Which refers simply to the fact that there are a lot of people walking around who don't think they need a Messiah. They don't need to be saved because they have nothing to be saved from in their minds. And knowing that in their minds they're not the worst person in the world, that they're not bad enough, that there's always someone else they can point to who's worse than they are, makes them feel secure and confident that they have nothing to worry about. They're not bad enough to know they need something to help them get to heaven. People live their lives focused on the here and now and they measure their righteousness by what they see according to earthly standards, not recognizing that God's standards are so much higher. And as long as we can find someone we know, or someone in the news, some celebrity, let's say, whose life is more depraved and more disobedient and more self-centered than our own, and as long as we can find that person on a regular basis, then we're going to feel good enough about ourselves by comparison that we don't necessarily think we have any problems to worry about when it comes to our state before God. There are many, sometimes that's characterized as the scale approach to measuring our righteousness. People think that as long as my good is better than my bad, I'll make it to heaven. It's the same kind of thinking. It's judging according to the wrong standard. But if you keep that thinking long enough, then it begins to eventually turn and add a new flavor. And that next step that you'll begin to assume is that when someone suffers tragedy, we explain that tragedy is nothing more than they're just desserts. They're not as good as I am. They get what they deserve. And, of course, when we do that, we forget we ourselves are sinners. Now, what is Jesus doing here? Why is he bringing this up? Why throw this in in the midst of this casual discussion in the crowd about these people in, in Jerusalem that suffered this death? Why throw this in? Well, look at what he's been doing as we leave chapter 12. As we left chapter 12, he's explaining to them that you know who I am. You cannot hide behind ignorance. You know the signs. You know what you were taught about the Messiah. And you know that if you are guilty of something and you're being dragged to the magistrate and you're not willing to confess those sins, that if you arrive at the magistrate in that unrepentant condition, you're going to face judgment. And now in chapter 13, he, he deals with this comment, this idle comment from the crowd about these Galileans and says, are you, are you people thinking you're too good? Are you thinking that you don't have anything to worry about? 
Are you assuming that I'm talking to someone else and not to you about the need to repent? If you are, he says, you're missing it because you too likewise will perish. You can't believe in a Messiah until you believe you need a Messiah. Said another way, you and I today, you won't ask to be saved until you believe you have something to be saved from. The first step for a man or woman to come to faith in the gospel is to recognize they have sin and a need for forgiveness. And repenting of sin is the prerequisite to understanding the truth of the gospel. And that's what he's commanding them to do. At this critical point, and we've said when we taught earlier in chapters 11 and in chapters 12, that chapters 11, 12, and 13 of Luke represent a pinnacle in the chapter because they represent the turning point in Jesus' ministry where he goes from an open invitation of the gospel to receiving a rejection from the nation of Israel and confirming that rejection and having nothing more to do with the nation of Israel from chapter 14 onward. And at that point, doing nothing more than preparing his disciples for his end in Jerusalem and for the foundation of the church to follow. We'll bring that out as we teach through those chapters, but I want you to see how at this point you're at the pinnacle. He's calling on repentance. He's saying, you see the signs, you know what this is about. There is judgment coming, and if you don't make a decision soon, you're going to face the judge. Father, we do lift up your word to you and acknowledge that it is given to men so that we might know the truth and confess it, Father, and believe in your only Son given for our sins. And Father, we come together tonight as as believers and uh, call together to study your word, but always mindful, Father, that a walk with you in your word requires a continual renewal through repentance. And a recognition, Father, that we were saved not for our own sake, but to your glory and for a purpose that you have ordained in our lives. We pray, Father, we would be conscious of that and, and willing, Father, and courageous enough to walk it out in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the time we've had this evening to study in this group. And, and I do pray, Father, in the, week, in the weeks to come, you would uh, continue to guide our walk and open us up to where we might put this teaching to, to good use. Are we harboring, Father, the the misguided view of of cause and effect in the lives of those we know? Have we sat in judgment of friends or family uh, because of misfortune and taken a a satisfaction that we were not the ones who fell into that that calamity that they did and and perhaps, Father, attributing it to sin in their own life, ignoring that same sin in ours? I pray, Father, we would not be that kind of poor witness. I pray, Father, that if uh, we've made that mistake, that you convict us of that even now so that we might learn and and do better and be that witness we should be. And I pray, Father, over the food. Thank you for the provision tonight of our refreshments. And thank you, Father, for the good company that will follow and for the chance to continue in this study as a group. And uh, even now, Father, I pray for our, our safe travel home when we end tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.